colleagues. Our next speaker will be Stephanie Schur. Um, just uh, introduce her a little bit. Uh, Stephanie was a contestant uh, for the Mars Colony Prize. Uh, she made the semifinals, uh, didn't make the finals, uh, but there was, um, you know, because you had to have points across many aspects of it, uh, but there was one uh, part where she truly excelled, uh, and that was in the aesthetic dimension. And uh, I think what she, she laid out there is, is a real contribution. And so she sent in an abstract as a, a track talk. I said, no, let's have this as one of the closing plenaries, because let's see um, the vision of what we could have on Mars. So uh, you ready? Um, hi, everyone. Uh, so my name is Stephanie, and um, Stephanie Shore, and just a quick background in me. I've, I've done, um, I'm a landscape architect and urban uh, designer. I've worked um, on projects, um, large urban projects around the world, as well as um, small gardens and things, and um, ecosystem management um, in national parks and national forests. Um, and I've also, uh, I taught, um, at University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and UC Davis in the School of um, Environmental Design. And I'm gonna be teaching again at Syracuse University uh, back on the East Coast starting in January. So what we're gonna really focus on in here is really some of these um, aesthetic components that, are, that was really asked to you know, focus on here. And so there, my entry, as um, Dr. Zubrin mentioned, that you know was um, had a lot of um, vari various components of of aesthetics added into it, but I didn't do a lot of the technical analysis. So um, with that, what I wanted to do was just kind of take a moment and walk through um, very briefly what I had done um, to kind of set the stage for what I was, what I was done, what I had done for that. And then we'll get into some other things. So um, anyone who, we've seen a lot of charts and graphs and numbers um, over the weekend and for those who really like to see that, here you go. All right? <laughs> and that is the end of the charts and graphs. <laughs> All, right. All right. All right, so what I'm gonna do real, is, is try to go through really quickly some of the, um, the foundation of the, the proposal that I had made, which is like, you know, kind of went down a different track than most of the other ones did. Um, and I'm going to kind of go through it really quickly um, to really, so, just so we have time to get into the juicy stuff. Um, and you, the, um, the report that's kind of the book that's going to get published will have some of the more details in it um, to really kind of explain where I was go coming from on some of those things. So basic things, sunlight and radiation. So um, what I was really coming from is that you need sunlight. You need, when you are um, wherever you are, you know, it, it's such an important part of, of you know, good um, health, um, you know, working with people and, you know, setting up circadian rhythms to really have a healthy environment to live in. And so I was really wanted to um, really emphasize the ability to bring in sunlight. And, and then I, you know, kind of looked at, well, you know, radiation. Um, honestly, we have been dealing as human beings with an excess of solar radiation on this planet um, since the dawn of humanity. And um, what we've done is we've developed cultural adaptations to it um, from sitting under a tree <laughs> um, to building um, Roman colonnades that pr provide shade in the middle of the summer and, you know, uh, like, you know, in the middle of a hot day. And then, of course, fashion. I mean, that's, that's the thing. It's like fashion we bring in to protect ourselves from solar radiation, whether it's hats or sunglasses. And, you know, as a culture, we, we develop adaptations to, to work with the environment we live in. So on Mars, um, there are these features called fossae, um, which are these fractures that go along, you know, different places. And a lot of them follow along, you know, this, this big um, event that, that created Valles Marineris, I think. Um, and there are these, these li very linear, very narrow, um, they're like canyons. And um, to me, when I look at them, I always kind of think, oh, they, they look like Mars's stretch marks. 
and you know, you mean know, and it's just so you know, and so I, I like to you know, I always try to imagine did the did the Romans imagine that the the god of war had stretch marks on, um, <laughs> but um, so using that, using like a um, a small place like right here in the in the the, cent the beginning of it, that you can then begin to bring um, build a colony that that comes in segments, just smaller pieces that, you know, as people arrive, maybe 20 the first time, maybe 50, maybe 100 as they go, you, you keep adding to it. You keep start, you start in a very small portion of it, right in the, um, the beginning of one of those, and then you just keep going and adding in. And all you have to do from that point is to cover it with this glass dome and make it out of these very simple, um, like square pieces of like HDPE or something. Um, that that provide a layer of extra um, an extra layer of, of radiation protection and you know some of these they're typically from tens to hundreds of meters wide and deep and they can be hundreds or even thousands of kilometers long um, and you create this thing called that I was calling an environment envelope and then you build within that um, and once you get into that you really the idea is to create an ecosystem inside that. And this, I, and you know, what I like to call micro terraforming, rather than rather than really terraforming the whole planet, in, inside there is to create some sense of an ecosystem. Um, and you know, making some assumptions that we, I think we know that now that waters, you know, can be plentiful there, um, and we want to bring in air as part of this biological process. And the key thing is that we want to keep. Um, the people and the ecosystem together, you know, living together and make, being a part of this. Um, so with that, um, you build along this entire, um, like starting one end and building along this length of this, this um, fossa, like to do the first one, and you make these um, th up above the rim, these air gardens of just different types of, of um, production plants um, that will grow fast, like um, jute, hemp, kenaf, um, things that can really help us, you know, produce oxygen for the environment, but not by itself. They always have to be um, um, supplemented with technology. And then from there, so, so the idea there then is, you know, you're building into this, this canyon and um, you have those air gardens up on the top up above the rim there and you can kind of see them. And with the, you know, building in this canyon, you have this idea of, of you can protect yourself from a lot of the radiation coming in just because of, just by the geography there. And then you build this dome over it, you protect yourself a little bit more, have a little more radiation protection. And then all of the buildings that you then build in it would can have a nice thick roof on them. And all of those things together can provide enough radiation protection to really um, allow people to be comfortable and safe there without having to live in underground caves. And of course, um, diversity, um, energy, just diverse and disperse is the key. And I think we've, you know, a lot of talk has been about that. Um, battery packs, I think in every room in every building um, would be I ideal. Um, Kilopower, which of course, after a hard day's work, um, controlling robots, um, it's nice to relax. Um, Kilopower makes a nice beach umbrella to, to chill out at under. <laughs> All right, from there, let's get into it. We've gone from the big, basic ingredients, now we're getting into the secret sauce here. Color, materials, um, this ecosystem, good food. Not just any food, good food. <laughs> Um, fun and recreation. So um, Christopher Alexander, um, uh, professor at UC Berkeley for decades, wrote some uh, seminal books um, on the idea of you know, different factors coming into um, community design. And so in a pattern language, with probably the biggest book, the most well known, he identifies a bunch, uh, a number of these different patterns, and um, 
he's got over 250 of them listed in the book. It's a very good read. It's a long read. It's a very in-depth read. So, but what I've decided to do is to kind of pick out, and he kind of makes this point where you, you don't need to like look at all of them. You can kind of pick and choose and kind of begin to put something together based on you know, what, what, your, what your goals are in, in a design, in um, an environment. And I just wanted to point out a couple of them here, some of my um, per personal favorites, um, like pools and streams, high places, um, food stands, um, tapestry of light and dark, which is kind of an important thing of bringing that sunlight in. Um, and then, again, of course, we go into sunny places, um, uh, alcoves, garden seating, you know, all these things that you can begin to bring in filtered light. Um, one of my personal favorites on here is uh, child caves. You know, as uh, you know, you, you, you have a, a colony of about a thousand people. I mean, you're going to start having children and everything. And um, you think about, you know, all of us think back when we were kids and, you know, you get together with all your friends and you go try to find a place to hide from the adults and be mischievous or whatever, you know. <laughs> Um, it's an important part of, of living and, and, you know, having this vibrant life there is, you know, as you're growing up to be able to experience some of that. So from that, um, there's no, no set, I didn't pull specific things out of there because you really, you know, can really start to freely look at some of these things um, on, you know, in, in different ways. And so I came up with these design principles. And actually, before I go on, I want to, um, I want to just point out um, this background image is a, is a um, SketchUp model that I was working on. And my laptop um, died out on me um, two days ago. And I was about 90% done with this presentation. That's, so I, there was, um, uh, I had a nice SketchUp model that it, um, is not, did not make it in here. But that's, that was a piece of it. Um, so, so the design principles are, that, I'm, that I really want to talk about is this integral inter ecosystem that you're bringing together um, um, the people and the environment. Um, vernacular styles is rather than, you know, it's rather than just, you know, some major planned thing that we can really let the people decide as they go, like how they're going to build, what they want this to look like. They're going to, they're going to decide each step of the way. Um, what to add next, where the next building should go, where the, where the colony should expand, how much it should expand. Um, narrow walking streets, that's always an important thing in any community, you think like that's where everyone comes to, is this, you know, this, this street where people um, gather. And if you have this long linear um, arrangement in, these fossa, in, the, in a fossa, um, you can have this narrow linear walking street where all, you know, every, all this activity can happen. Um, colonnades are a way to just bring some of the, that additional sense of shade, as I was uh, talking about earlier, to protect from r radiation shade. Um, blurring the lines of interior and exterior. Um, once you're inside this environment, why do we, why do we always have buildings out in, in our lives? It's, it's usually to protect ourselves from the weather. But if you're inside this environment, you don't really need that protection. So the line, that idea of what's inside and what's outside really gets blurred. Um, you can really play with that. Um, and of course, bringing the sun in um, with courtyards. And I started to show you know, in these models um, like this, this idea of this courtyard building style that brings, no matter where you are in here, you bringing sunlight in um, so that there's always natural light available to everyone. Um, color, boy, that's gonna be a big thing. Um, Mars is kind of a drab, sing, you know, monochromatic um, uh, place. And so bringing color in, we'll talk about that in a, a bit more. Um, and work in social spaces, the blending people, you know, this blurring of social and work and everything will um, be able to happen. Ro rooftop gardens um, and terrace farming. So in that, we bring this ecosystem together. Um, we'll have terrace farms doing, um, kind of like staple crops on the sunny side of a slope in there, um, in, the, in this canyon. And then there, all the rooftops would have more intensive gardens that could, everything could be supplemented with um, additional um, artificial lighting as needed. Um, but this idea that um, the, the ecosystem and the gardens and the um, agriculture are all part of our everyday life and just intermixed with our, everything we're doing. Uh, rather than kind of set aside and, and off in some other capsule or something. 
Oops. Wrong button. There we go. There we go. Okay. So the ecosystem. Terrace, terrace farming um, along um, the sunny side of the slope. being built um, by the people piecemeal. And by the way, I forgot to mention that, you know, if you, when you build it in these sections, you can, um, the idea there is in each section that gets built, it gets built as the, as the colony grows, but um, it also provides protection, you know, in the case of like a, a micrometeor or something that it contains the damage to just one small section and then it can, um, you know, the people can, Along that street, you can have like an evacuation tube underneath the, the street that people can um, evacuate in order to, you know, help um, repair the damage or, you know, until the damage is repaired. Um, so monolithic architecture looks great, makes these wonderful images, and we've seen some amazing ones by um, Brian and, and others. Um, when the colony gets up to like a million or, or more people, um, this could be great. This, this will be very practical. But for like the first thousand colonists, um, they're not gonna be able to do this. Um, so what they are gonna be able to do is this idea of this vernacular style, this um, bringing just building piecemeal as we go. And the people will then, you know, who are there decide where the next building should go, what, what purpose it should serve. And, and just let it grow very organically based on their needs, based on what they decide they want. And people are gonna be coming from different parts of the world, you know, different parts of the world, different cultures, um, and they're gonna bring their own unique cultural style to that. And this is, in, the idea is to have this environment where all of that can happen and be freely, um, you know, you know this, this big eclectic blend of styles that they can explore with. Um, typical building materials that we've talked about in other um, discussions, Concrete, um, will, you know, regular concrete will be probably readily available. Manufacture of metals, um, stone. Um, there's going to be so much stone. If you bring, if you have artisans, if you have craftspeople, um, they're going to want to work this material and experiment with it, and make these beautiful um, um, surfaces, uh, paving and walls, and 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 build with these surfaces. Uh, you know these different materials and they're, you know, they're gonna look and see all these different ways that they can work with it, whatever stone they have available to them. Um, from, the, um, uh, from those air gardens, you'll have lots of bamboo. So there's gonna be lots of different bamboo materials like um, we can see over here, um, various different ways that that could be in integrated in, as a wood. Um, and then um, there's a lot of clay um, that's gonna be available. So ceramic tiles can become a really big thing. And you know, again, with, with people, you know, um, architects and artisans um, really exploring this idea of, of making ceramics um, there in the colony. And um, with that, there's gonna be a demand, like I mentioned before, um, color. And so all, there's gonna be a whole economy built around like being able to make, make, make these um, materials and make pigments for color, for tile, for paint, for clothing dyes and everything. So that's gonna be like a big thing. Um, and then various you know, technological composite materials. Um, so with this idea of this concrete, um, I know we've talked a lot about um, 3D printing and making all kinds of um, interesting forms. But what I was thinking was that, start with something simple, basic building blocks. Make a kit of parts um, that we can do just kind of like a lot of like what we do here on earth like we've been doing for a very long time is build these blocks um, and then be able to assemble them either robotically or by people all you know by craftspeople there and and there's all kinds of beautiful creative ways you could begin to do that um, as you do as you go as you build those things and you can add um, different mixing different materials wood and, and the block and the clay and the stone um, so here we go into this idea of these um, walking streets. Um, so in, in this idea of, of this linear 
um, arrangement of this of the colony. You can um, what that what that also provides is is a maximization of edge. Like the the colony is very long. It allows as you as you approach, um, at, you know, at, you can bring material, bring resources into the colony along this very long edge. You're really maximizing that edge, um, and that really helps with the resources. Now you carry that into um, these walking streets, and it's the you know in an ecosystem, edge is the the place where um, the most dynamic part of any ecosystem, where these different things blend together. And in, a, in an urban environment where the building meets the street um, is a kind of edge. And that's where all the magic happens in life, in, you know, in community life, is like where these things meet. And you can begin to imagine you know, these walking streets with cafes and things all around with all these different materials, the stone, the tile, um, the paints, um, our environment, our trees, plants, everything just mixed together in there. And here's that idea of that colonnade in the plan over right here, and providing this, you know, it's been used for thousands of years to provide some radiation, sense of radiation protection here on Earth from the sun. Um, don't want to get sunburned. And the same idea can be employed um, as this feature built into um, the, it built into the whole colony um, in you know, different ways so that people can reduce their overall exposure to radiation while still feeling very comfortable and free to walk around out in the sun. <clears throat> so here we go, blurring the interior and the exterior. So once you start imagining that, you know, we have a lot of examples, these you know, that we do now, you know, in, in warmer climates where, you know, cafes or big open air, um, we get into these um, different types of, of buildings that have these courtyards that bring air in and this idea of you can come, go out into the street, come, ben, come into the building, but it's all just, they're all kind of blurred together. The only reason you need to have like a, like a true interior is maybe for privacy, maybe for, you know, quiet. Um, in any of, these, any of these colonies, you know, start thinking about sound and, and noise of thousands of people that are in this contained space and how you begin to manage your own life in that and manage, um, you know, how the sound carries through the, um, through the colony. Um, and again, bring in the sun. Um, uh, Moroccan riads. I don't know if everyone, anyone's ever um, seen those. They're these, these courtyard um, houses with these, these Andalusian, this uh, Spanish style um, courtyards in the middle that, again, bring in the sunlight, um, allow this interior and exterior blurring and blending to happen, um, but always having light, natural light come in. And um, even, even the nobility of Westeros un understood that from. Um, and and, and a, on a note on, on the water feature here, um, bathing, um, instead of having like separate bathtubs, I think, I'm always imagining that, you know, we'll have like, just like old ancient Roman baths, have these um, uh, communal bathing facilities that are, could be really quite beautiful and really quite a great um, uh, social experience. More examples, you know, bringing in um, the ecosystem, the plants, the, the, the sunlight, uh, various different ways to, you know, have that, that roof, that thick roof of, of protecting um, ecosystem, um, protecting, you know, from radiation, but still allowing the light in. Um, this is the Hotel of Jakarta, um, which I just love, is a great example of, of ideas for doing that. Um, so here we go, color. Um, now we're not talking about eating crayons, <laughs> uh, but but this idea that you know, in this in this environment, um, you can bring all kinds of color into this. Then people will really be starving for that um, on Mars. And so, just like we do in you know Mediterranean climates, uh, to help brighten you know to, ways that we can really brighten up the colony by introducing um, all these different color elements into it. And again, like I, like I said earlier, the, 
the availability of pigments from, um, from minerals, and also from the plant materials that will be in there, which you know will make it. Um, we'll have a, like a. We'll probably have a really nice palette of colors to um, explore with and, and work with. Um, so the whole idea of this this ecosystem and these roof gardens and terrace agriculture, um, again, by bringing it together with the with the lives of the people, the daily lives of the people. Um, they begin to become these social spaces. They begin to become these beautiful places where you might be growing grapevines to make some nice wine. You might be growing, you know, various herbs um, and peppers and, and everything else. You know, on the idea here is on on the terrace slopes is the staple crops of just kind of regular, you know, staple um, caloric crops, and then. Um, up on the rooftop gardens, you have all the more intensive gardening, things like we normally do in an, in an urban setting in our, in our square foot gardens and things. Um, blurring of work and social spaces. Once again, they can come together. There's no need to kind of keep them, keep those things separated. People are going to be collaborating. They're going to be working together and just have these environments that are very conducive to doing that. And, um, you know, Looking around, this is kind of scanning through these materials. Um, there's a jute rug. You know, if we have we're growing jute um, and and bamboo and hemp and things like that, you can make these materials. Maybe, maybe not the velour yet. I don't know, but <laughs> but but a lot of it is you know uh, you know from from bamboo material, these stools and chairs and tables and and there's the, there's so much um, so much possibility there. And then, of course, eating, street food culture. Um, um, individual kitchens are not going to be um, common. People, you know, so sh people are going to be sharing meals. They're going to be eating out, um, you know, eating together, uh, and having lots of different options. And um, um, so, it's always going to be this community experience. And um, uh, last thing I have on the list there is sausages will be a big thing. So, um, one thing I didn't mention earlier. <laughs> Is you know when you create this ecosystem, you're going to bring in um, um, plants and animals of all every different trophic level from you know like you know, and I, and I like to say about a hundred species per trophic level, all the way from microbiota all the way up to maybe the largest thing might be rabbits and goats, um, and then um, there is a, a system there where where um, all of those animals you know that whole ecosystem is going to work together. And somewhere at the top of that food chain is the people, and there's gonna, it's going to have to be intensively managed, which means that, um, like I said, um, bugs, small animals, um, um, sausages will be, will be a common popular item. <laughs> um, and recreation. Um, keeping, keeping ways for people to have interesting lives in, within that environment. Walking will be very common. I love swimming, and you know, and I think we can do something. Especially if we, we use these three D printer technologies, we can make a very um, natural um, feature. And the idea here is not only with these small waterfalls, we can actually have um, use the, use that idea to help um, create a humidity in the, in the um, in the colony. And by the way, um, I'm, I had to put in the picture of yoga. I'm, I'm a yoga teacher as well, so I had to include that. And then um, skiing. I think you know once you start building in this canyon environment, you have these slopes. Um, this is actually an, an in indoor ski area in um, Germany, and there's no reason why that can't be done there. And then finally, I think clothing. Um, we've seen a lot of different ideas in the past about what kind of clothing might be used in outer space, <laughs> but um, with jute, hemp, canap, a pashmina, go you know from goats and silk. Um, clothing people are going to be wearing there might look more like look more like these things, things that are hand woven, things that are machine woven at, from those natural materials. Um, and we may even be able to have Rihanna um, give us some um, fashion advice on some of that stuff. Um, so as the, and last thing I want to just say is, you know, as this grows, if you use these fosse to build, um, they can keep growing in, in each direction. Um, and you can build alongside them, and then you can start to connect them. And at that point, they could start going into the thousands or hundreds of thousands, even millions. And some of these will start to connect together, and it can just keep growing that way. Um, 
And finally, you know, beauty inspires. It's you know, when you have this beauty in there, people can begin to really live and enjoy um, that, that life. And instead of um, you know, feeling like they're trapped in there, they really become inspired and like out there. Um, and they start to explore an art. And um, from that, um, there's that one quote that I think most, most, most of us know, if you build it, they will come. But uh, what I want to say is, if you build it beautifully, they will come in masses. All right. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience? Uh, I, I don't know if you consciously uh, considered this, but I was thinking as you were talking, you had a lot of that vernacular architecture, sort of medieval cent city centers. And of course, that was sort of, in a way, that's a common, uh, common um, cause that like medieval city centers had to be packed close together like that because they had to be defended from attack. And in this case, you have to be defending from the exterior environment. Uh, yes, exactly. I mean, that's, I mean, that's the idea is, I mean, we, we have to be compact because we're, you know, it's, everyone's going to be, you know, living together and if we, um, you know, and sharing resources and the closer people are together, the easier it is to share resources. And that's why, you know, the, you know from the dawn of civilization, why people came together to live together in, in tight um, communities. Yeah. So first, um, a technical comment okay. uh, is I emphatically agree with your uh, insistence on using natural light. Um, and I think uh, actually a mistake that a number of the uh, colony uh, people made was um, in putting greenhouses underground or otherwise shielded with concrete and lighting them with lights, which um, uses a huge amount of power and is completely unnecessary. The, the Martian atmosphere, as thin as it is, is thick enough to mask out solar flares. That is, the um, looking straight up to space uh, from the ground, you have uh, 16 grams per square centimeter, which is as thick as a, a solar flare shelter would be, and uh, actually averaged over the sky, it's more like uh, 60 grams, because um, most of the stuff comes in in a slant. But anyway, to, to move on, uh, your talk reminded me a lot of a book that I once read by Jane Jacobs called The Death and Life of Great American Cities. And uh, I take it to, from you nodded that you, you've read that book. And um, so do you want to talk a little bit about uh, your views on Jane Jacobs' ideas on, on cities? Well. Sure. Um, I actually, um, I actually have a Jane Jacobs quote that I was um, intending to uh, include. Um, so Jane Jacobs, it was, um, for those who don't um, know, um, she was um, a journalist and a prolific author through the 20th century, through the second half of the 20th century, who wrote um, a lot about urban form and, and a lot of the um, um, the the issues and problems with, you know, particularly in America, um, about, ur you know, where urban urbanism was going. Um, and a lot of the changes that we've seen over the past few decades has been um, um, inspired um, by some of her writing. Um, uh, and she, she was very active in New York City as well, um, stopping the Robert Moses Freeway from going through the middle of Central Park at, at one point. Um, um, she wrote, um, intricate minglings of different uses in cities are not a form of chaos. Um, on the contrary, they represent a, com a complex and highly developed form of order. And I, I just love that because it really is, you know, it looks, you know, we look at cities and sometimes it looks so very chaotic, but it's really, it's just this com very complex order. And that's, you know, that's the, the most important, you know, one of the, the important things that she really brought to the table in terms of urban planning. Hi, uh, Debbie Wilkinson with the Open Luna Foundation. And um, you may have uh, already, you know, may already be in your program, but it uh, didn't really see it so much in the pictures. But there's been, um, you know, entire colonies of uh, American Indians or Mexican Indians or whatever, you know, in the Southwest and, and down into Mexico, where they actually lived in the walls. So the sandstone, they carved it out. And, um, that was kind of always my thought was we probably build more, you know, inward through just, especially now you've got a, a sealed 
at the top mm -hmm. surface. Um, so uh, would you like to uh, comment on, on what your thoughts are on those? Um, absolutely, thank you. It's a great question because that was, um, a, a lot of the inspiration came from those things, whether it's, um, you know, the, the cliff dwellings of the Anasazi in, 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 south, in the Southwest. I, I lived in Arizona for a long time and so I got to really explore those areas a lot. Um, uh, the Wadi Rum in, um, environments in, um, uh, on the Arabian Peninsula, very similar as well and, very, you know, kind of sim very similar um, uh, development patterns, you know, his very ancient. And then of course there's Petra. When you go to, you know, in Jordan and Petra, it's the same thing. It's the, this canyon where they built this incredible um, city right in the stone. Um, so all of those things, you know, become way, things we've done here on Earth for thousands of years that can really teach us a lot about what to do. Okay. Third last question. I have an apology to give you from us scientists. My name is Bill Gardner from Analitech. My bread and butter is doing environmental testing and looking out. Mm -hmm. And the, the apology is because we've given uh, you architects and people a bad impression about radiation. Um, like water, radiation has a lot of uses and there's a lot of forms of it that are very helpful and, and, and beneficial for us. But like water, if you get too much of it, you can drown in it. So for example, when sp Comet Spring sighting arrived at Mars when MAVEN was there at the same time, it electrified the whole planet. There are beautiful auroras all around the planet. They say it was X-ray based. Uh, but I would uh, uh, suggest you keep an eye on the radiation of all forms and that you think about that, not just as something from hide to hide from, but to form as part of your design. Thank you. Right. Yeah, thank you. All right, let's give a big round of appreciation for Stephanie.